All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Sutherland. I am the editor-in-chief of the SICE Review of International Affairs. Um, we're glad so many of you are able to join us today. Um, for those of you not yet familiar with the SICE Review, um, it is the longest-running print journal of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. It's published twice yearly by the Foreign Policy Institute here at SICE. And uh, SICE graduate students have traditionally served as the editorial board of the journal. Um, so each year, um, five of us uh, set the theme of the issue, um, contact authors, um, really just manage the entire publication process. But this didn't begin until 1980. It initially started as an alumni magazine. Um, yeah, so SICE Review is dedicated to advancing the debate on leading contemporary issues in world affairs. The journal seeks to bring a fresh and policy relevant perspective to global political, economic, and even security questions. We typically do this by publishing a mix of essays from academics, policymakers, and experts that straddle the, the boundary between scholarly inquiry and practical experience, because we think that's one thing that SICE as an institution does so well. Uh, former contributors to the journal uh, include policymakers such as Madeleine Albright, Richard Holbrook, Paul H. Nitza, and scholars such as Francis Fukuyama, Charles, Dur Charles Duran, and Nassim Taleb. Um, so our goal of confronting contemporary issues isn't always easy. Um, our recent publications have grappled with complex issues such as the um, expanding global mass migration crisis and uh, sort of radical changes that are taking place in voting in elections around the world. This year, we decided to turn our attention to something a bit more um, immediate uh, in the international community, which is the role of the fourth estate. So journalists around the world have long served as providers of information to the public and a check on state power and authoritarian impulses all over the world. However, we've, we, we think that emerging challenges to press, free, press freedom worldwide are threatening to reshape the role that journalists play in societies across the globe. Um, although contempt for the press is nothing new in certain parts of the world, uh, since we decided to start working on the issue, um, the threats have become even more severe. On October 2nd of last year, the murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi and the confused response from countries who once championed press freedom worldwide shocked the international community to its core. Today, it's difficult to distinguish between the rhetoric of President Trump and Rodrigo Duterte on the topic of the media, which we think is astounding. Um, this issue of SICE Review contains 13 pieces examining everything from the global threat environment facing journalists today to the role of social media companies in the changing media landscape. Uh, the issue features writing from academic experts and members of the media who have contended with these challenges directly. Um, this is really important to us because for each issue of the journal, we make sure to solicit articles from both practitioners and academic experts, um, and those who happen to be both, because as we all know in this building, it's not a clear dichotomy. Um, so to us, it's a particular honor when we're able to publish the work of these experts, both from around the DC community and all over the world. And joining me today are three of our contributors. Uh, I will introduce them all very briefly, and uh, then uh, one of our panelists has requested that we go around the table very quickly. Um, just a short uh, two-sentence introduction will do. Um, so, Medea Afzal, sitting immediately to my left, is a visiting fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. Dr. Afzal is the author of Pakistan Under Siege, Extremism, Society, and the State. She writes regularly uh, for Pakistani and international publications, including Dawn, the Cairo Review, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and the Washington Post, and is also the author of several book chapters, policy reports, and journal articles. She previously taught at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland College Park, and has also taught at SICE, so we're thrilled to welcome her back today. To her left is Mr. Patrick Butler. He is president and chief executive officer of America's public television stations. He previously served as senior vice president of the Washington Post Company, special assistant to US Senate Majority Leader Howard H. Baker Jr., and speechwriter for President Ford. He was also a founder of the Times Mirror Center for the People and the Press and a member of the board of the Pew Research Center. To his left is Dr. Stephen Livingston. He is a professor in the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs and the Elliott School of International Affairs. He's also a senior fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, and his research focuses on the role of information technologies and media on governance, development, accountability, and human rights. Um, so starting from Dr. Uh, Livingston's left, if we just briefly go around the room. Uh, yeah. Oh, right there. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. 
totally retired federal government. I'm Julian Strawn. I'm a second year grad student and the director of Cultural Affairs. Uh, those of you on the side there, uh, we don't want you to think we've forgotten about you. So <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and uh, introduce yourselves. I'm Melanie Kinsley. I'm Melanie Kinsley. Okay. All right, um, back in that corner as well, or? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I've gone ahead and asked each of our panelists to prepare just brief remarks on the article they wrote for us and the other work that they're doing uh, in their careers as it pertains to uh, the role of the media in international affairs and you know threats to press freedom today. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Dr. Afzal now, and she'll kick us off. All right, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize I was first in the lineup, so. I took a big bite of this um, wrap, excuse me. Um, hi everyone, can you hear me? I have a bit of a cold, so I'm gonna try to use the mic a little bit as well. Um, thank you all for coming, thanks for having us here. Congratulations on the <coughs> issue coming out. Um, a lot of hard work um, from, the, uh, from all of you uh, who work at the Science Review, so uh, I'm very pleased to have a, ha have a piece um, here on Pakistan and the multifaceted threat environment um, for Pakistan's media. So I'll very briefly talk um, about certain elements of, and, and certain sort of key takeaways uh, from, my, uh, from my piece. Um, and I thought a quote from um, uh, a Reporters Without uh, Borders um, report um, in the latest annual report um, would be great to start us off. So that kind of sums up the, the state of Pakistan's media. Um, and this is on page 36 in the, the issue of the size review, a couple of pages into my article if you want to turn to it. Um, the Pakistani media are regarded as among the most vibrant in Asia, but they are targeted by extremist groups, Islamist organizations, and the feared intelligence agencies all of which are on RSF's list of predators of press freedom. And the organization ranked Pakistan as 139th out of 180 countries in its uh, 2017 World Press Freedom Index. So uh, that, that presents a little bit of a bleak picture, but, but um, it starts off saying, you know, the, the Pakistani media are vibrant. So the, the picture I present here is obviously mixed. Um, there are, and I'll start off from the good part of the story, um, which is that there are dozens of cable television channels in Pakistan um, that are dominated by talk shows, um, sort of the kinds that you see on CNN on an evening. That is not just one channel in Pakistan or three channels the way you know it is here, let's say Fox, MSNBC, and CNN. That is the entirety of 
the dozens of television channels um, if you were to flip through channels at 9 p.m. On, on a weeknight. And they're all talking about politics, okay? Um, and there are these sort of a very vibrant, boisterous, loud discussions about politics. Um, but what is not mentioned uh, in critical terms is Pakistan's military. And that is for a reason, because the military enforces red lines on what can be said about it. A, criticism of the military is, is not, not liked. But, but B, there are certain elements um, of discussion in Pakistan that are considered sensitive and so pushed back on. Um, and I highlight a couple of these in the article. One is discussion of ethnic insurgencies and ethnic rebellions, uh, which are considered threatening to the cohesion of the Pakistani state and you know, Pakistani nationalism. So there is a long-running insurgency in Pakistan's um, southwest province of Balochistan that has been, um, that is basically not talked about because the, the military enforces red lines on discussion of that. And now there is a recent movement in Pakistan's northwest province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa called the Pashtun Tahafuz movement that is not talked about as well. Um, articles written about it, let's say you're an op-ed columnist, right, in Pakistan's major English language newspapers. If you submit an article on the Pashtun Tahafuz movement, um, your uh, editorial page sort of director is going to turn back to you and say, look, I got a call from somebody in, in the intelligence agencies who told me I can't publish this. So while you are pretty much allowed to publish anything else, not this, okay? Um, similarly, television channels get calls from uh, people in the intelligence agencies telling them not to cover uh, those kinds of movements. So that's sort of one element. The second element that the military sort of enforces red lines on, and as I said, some of this is, a lot of this is behind the scenes. These red lines are enforced behind the scenes. It's calls, it's cuts in advertising revenue, it's intimidation, sometimes it's even violence. Somebody can get picked up, a journalist can get picked up by the intelligence agencies. A lot of this is opaque because we are not, we're not seeing it in person. Um, the second thing, uh, going back to sort of the, the red lines that are enforced, the second red line that's enforced is on the military, on coverage of the military's relationship with militant groups in the country. So the military allowing militant groups to operate. So the militant groups that target India, and this is very much in the news these days, of course, uh, the militant groups that target India, the lashkar e taiba and the jaysh e Mohammed, among others, um, discussion of the Haqqani network and the military's ties with that. Those are discussions that are, again, um, not, not allowed. Um, so um, I'll, I'll share a couple of statistics that will illustrate this. A lot of the, a lot of the sort of the censorship occurs through self-censorship um, that journalists and media organizations undertake out of a desire for self-preservation. So on page 37, a couple of statistics that I give um, are from a recent survey. Um, and it's a, and, and you know, what's striking is that 88% of those journalists who responded said that they self-censor out of fear. Um, and 60% said that they self-censored information about the security establishment or about religion. 83% said that they censored information about militancy and terrorism. So I'll give you another personal example. I don't think I've, I have it in this paper. Um, but uh, for a few years, I wrote a regular column for one of Pakistan's newspapers, um, the Express Tribune, which is, um, uh, was the, uh, is the Pakistani partner of the International New York Times. Now I write much more often for Dawn which is another newspaper in Pakistan. Um, and the Express uh, Tribune, f at, a, at a certain point in time, um, asked me to not, uh, A, they, would, they, might, they might sort of tweak around words that I was using, again, t for safety. So let's say I said, you know, I had a discussion about Pakistan's blasphemy laws. That's, again, sort of something that is, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, 
that's again something that is very sensitive in Pakistan, an issue that's very sensitive. It's also been in the media. Um, they would, they would um, delete blasphemy and just talk about Pakistan's laws, which kind of makes the point um, uh, hard to get across, right? But again, out of a desire for self-preservation, they would do this because Pakistan's blasphemy laws, um, any any criticism of Pakistan's blasphemy laws is considered blasphemy in it in and of itself, and it opens you up um, uh, for intimidation or worse. Um, and then during the height of the Pakistan Taliban um, attacks on uh, media houses, again, some of which I've discussed here, um, when I uh, wrote a, a piece about, about the Taliban, I've worked on extremism in Pakistan for the past many years. My book that came out last year is on extremism. Um, in the in the country, and now it's much easier to talk about it. But at the height of the Pakistan Taliban insurgency, when these newspapers feared for their lives, uh, rightfully so, because they've been attacked. Um, again, I was told, "Look, we can't publish this piece um, that you've sent in." Other, you know, um, and. When enough of that started happening, that's when I sort of said, look, I'm not, I'm not gonna be writing this regular column anymore. And so um, there is, uh, because of that, there is um, obviously selection in what uh, the Pakistani citizens are able to consume in terms of the media. When, when, um, when journalists, writers, uh, um, op-ed columnists are not able to say what they want to say. Um, at the final couple of points, um, I will mention are some you know elements that I've already alluded to. Um, the other uh, the, the 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 other sort of big thing, other than the the military um, and criticisms of the military and and things that the military doesn't like being said, um, are um, that that are that is silenced is uh, secularism. Any sort of um, any, as I said, any criticism of Pakistan's blasphemy laws, but even even deeper, or even even more basic than that, um, uh, when secular bloggers are talking about a conception of Pakistan um, and and criticism of Pakistan as an Islamic state, um, that is something that opens them up for for um, intimidation, um, not just. You know, the, the, this intimidation occurs uh, from elements of the Pakistani state, again, the military, but also terrorist groups, Pakistan's Islamists. So this intimidation can occur on many fronts because it goes against Pakistan's conception of itself as an Islamic state and its definition of itself. Most, um, my final two points, most recently some of um, <clears throat> the intimidation um, of the media has come from political quarters. Um, and that is not too different from what is happening in the in the U.S. right now. So um, uh, there are a couple of media houses that have been labeled as fake news, as enemies of national security. Um, those are the ones that are critical of the Pakistani military, one, but also critical of the current party in power, and that were. Um, that supported or were seen as supporting the previous party in power. So, so there's uh, sort of now a political element um, to things as well. And I think the, the final point, and this is kind of a, a broad overview of the, the piece in some sense that I've given you right now, the final point is that there is partially some blame or um, th there are faults with Pakistan's media as well. It is not a victim in this entire environment in the country. So it often gives voice to conspiracy theorists. It will often give voice to those that are on the right of sort of a spectrum of, of people, not, not to sort of the liberal and progressive voices, but to those on the right. And so, uh, especially during the time of the Taliban mm -hmm. insurgency, but even now, you often see voices um, or hear voices <clears throat> that um, uh, not necessarily sympathize with extremists, but um, give a voice to views um, that are akin to uh, what Pakistan's extre extremists say. Um, so uh, 
so the media is not free of blame in, in the equation uh, of this sort of troubled environment uh, that it finds itself in. I'll end there. Thank you, Dr. Afsal. I, I think it's a very good point that the blame isn't always on one side or the other when it comes to state media dynamics. And I think your piece does a really good job of exploring that. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, next up, we have Mr. Patrick Butler. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, I, I think I'm the practitioner in this crowd here, so uh, pardon me for being a little, a little practical. I, I was, I was just thinking as as uh, uh, Medea was uh, was giving her presentation that one of my jobs at the Washington Post Company uh, was managing our international publishing uh, relationships. We we jointly published with the Los with the New York Times, the uh, the International Herald Tribune. Uh, and we had uh, partnerships uh, really in lots of places in the world, including, for example, with, with Japan, with, uh, with uh, uh, Yomiuri Shimbun, the biggest newspaper in Japan. Uh, so my day typically started uh, for several years at 4 o'clock in the morning talking with our friends in, in Paris and ended well after midnight talking to our friends in, in Tokyo. Uh, so it was a long day. Uh, w one of the things that, uh, that I was asked to do was to go to the... Uh, go to uh, Dubai uh, some years ago, uh, people in the Gulf, Cooperati Gulf Cooperation Council were interested in having a, a regional version of the, of the Washington Post published just for the, uh, for, for the, for the GCC countries. And uh, so I went and uh, uh, we had uh, lots of discussions with lots of people, uh, people in government, people in the advertising community, people in the, the university community, and so forth. And uh, we, we were interested in, in, in doing this, but uh, we, we kept saying, we, we, we are an independent newspaper. We have to have complete uh, 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 flexibility and independence to, uh, to cover what we want the way we want. Uh, and uh, that's that's not the tradition in this part of the country, in this part of the world. And uh, we just we just need you to be cognizant of this uh, tension that may that may exist from the very beginning. And at length, people uh, told us uh, toward the end of our conversations. Well, no, we we want you to be completely independent. Uh, it's important to us that you be completely independent. The only two things we ask you not to criticize are the government and Islam. <laughs> <laughs> and so we thought, well, that's not going to be, not, that's not going to work for us. So, uh, uh, so that, that never happened. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I sympathize with the people around the room here who are, who are trying to, to, to bring a free press to, uh, to, to places around the world. We have and, tr and have traditionally had uh, the freest press in, in, in the world. Uh, the, the, even between us and the United Kingdom, there, there is a great cliff that, that people fall off. There is something called the Official Secrets Act uh, in the United Kingdom that, 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 that sweeps uh, many things in, 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 in government uh, uh, proceedings under a, uh, under a rug or behind a curtain, uh, and we don't have that here. Uh, but th that, that may be the next freest press we have in, in, in the world, and, it, and it's, it's, it's light years away from what we consider to be uh, custom in our country. Uh, and, and we have had this, uh, this commitment to a free press enshrined in our, in our society and in our government, e even in our constitutions, from, from, from the very earliest days. The, the First Amendment uh, wasn't always the First Amendment. The, 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 the very First Amendment, which was struck, stricken from the, from the Constitution, uh, had to do with uh, with uh, the, the level of pay for members of Congress. And they, 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 they crossed that out and said, well, we'll, we'll deal with that later on. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but the First Amendment guaranteeing the freedom of the press and religion and speech and, and, and free assembly and so forth uh, was, was, was calculated uh, as, as a basis for, for a free republic and a free society with the founders all agreeing uh, that, uh, that, that people in a self-governing uh, democracy needed to have as much information as they could have uh, to, uh, to form the most well-informed uh, uh, opinions and, and decisions that they would make in, in the interest of their own self-government. Uh, there was no expectation in those days uh, that, the, that the press was going to be fair, that it was going to be balanced, that it was going to be objective. Uh, what we had in, in this country 
in colonial days uh, and, and for, for quite a long time thereafter were, 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 were organs that, that had, that had a, a very marked uh, a political slant to them. Uh, they were in the business of, 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 of promoting their, their individual uh, uh, political agendas and so forth, and it was expected that the American people would uh, sift through all of these uh, differing uh, uh, clangs of opinion and uh, and find their own version of the truth and uh, and make their own decisions based on that. It was a lot to ask of people, uh, but as Jefferson said, it, it's it's important not only that we have a free press, but that but that people be able to read the press and be able to receive the press. And so some of the earliest acts of Congress uh, were intended to uh, to create. Uh, were, uh, post roads and and to create favorable uh, postal rates so that uh, uh, so that these periodicals in the in the early days of the republic uh, could have uh, uh, general access around the around the uh, the, the population. Uh, so uh, that was the way things were in the, in the American press for uh, well over a hundred years, and uh, the first time that anyone decided to make objectivity uh, a, a goal of the, uh, of the news media in America was, uh, was Adolf Ox when he bought the, the New York Times in 1896 uh, and decided to, to use this, uh, this commitment to objectivity as a marketing tool, uh, uh, believing that among all the newspapers in, in New York City, uh, his would be the only one completely devoted to fact uh, devoid of, of, of political opinion and and uh, and, and, uh, and political agenda, uh, and and hoping that people in, in in the New York area would see the New York Times as as a place where they could repair for for honest r reporting and, and 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 objective analysis of, uh, of of the affairs of their city and their state, uh, and it it's his strategy succeeded uh, remarkably well for a remarkably long time. And uh, others would begin to uh, to 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 follow and and adopt that same uh, model. Uh, there were exceptions. The the Washington Post, where I worked for a long time, uh, was created as a, a as a frankly democratic newspaper by a man named Stilson Hutchins in 1877, who came to town from Ohio uh, specifically to. Uh, to reveal the, the many sins of the Rutherford B. Hayes administration. Uh, Hayes had been elected in 1876 in a highly contested uh, election, and uh, Stilson Hutchins was gonna hold uh, President Hayes and his administration to account, and, and there, was no, uh, there was no pretense about it. He was going to go after the Hayes administration, and he did. Uh, and several owners uh, beyond uh, Stilson Hutchins uh, continued that tradition when, when Eugene Meyer, the father of Catherine Graham, uh, bought the post at a bankruptcy sale in 1933. Uh, he changed all that. He he established a, uh, a, uh, a a list and he printed it on the front page of, of the post. Uh, principles of uh, of journalism as as the Washington Post henceforth would uh, would practice them, uh, and and it and it cl included a commitment to objectivity, to civility. Uh, to, to getting the, the truth as near as you could get it uh, and, and, and understanding that that's an iterative process as his, as his uh, son-in-law Phil Graham would famously say, journalism is the, is the first rough draft of history and so it's a continuing uh, iteration that uh, eventually finds uh, its way to the, to the ultimate truth, we hope. Uh, so, uh, so Mr. Meyer, Catherine Graham, uh, Phil Graham, Catherine Graham, Donald Graham uh, all subscribe to that uh, <coughs> to that same set of principles. And when Don sold the uh, Washington Post to, to Jeff Bezos in 2013, uh, Mr. Bezos accepted those same principles and has tried very hard to, uh, to, to continue them. Uh, the, 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 the Chicago Tribune was another exception to the, to the New York Times rule. They were, they were quite isolationist, quite conservative, uh, determinedly so and, uh, and, and proudly so. Uh, to the point that Archibald McLeish, who was the Librarian of Congress uh, during the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration, was the first to call a newspaper the enemy of the people. This was in about 1942 when, uh, 
when uh, uh, Colonel McCormick of, of, the, of, the, of the Chicago Tribune was uh, trying very hard to, uh, to indict FDR for, for practically everything and, and, and to keep us out, get us out and keep us out of, the, uh, of, of World War II. And so it was, uh, it, it's been a spotty record for, uh, for, for the American press. I, can, I have gone into, into this in, in a bit more detail. But for about 100 years, uh, th this commitment to objectivity and to, uh, and to uh, nonpartisanship and, and to searching for the truth uh, was, the, was, was, was the common thread in American journalism. When uh, the, the World Wide Web uh, came to be and when the Internet was, 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 uh, was established, um, all of that began to change, and it has changed with a, with, with a vengeance over the last uh, 15 years or so. And, uh, and we have reverted in, in some important ways to the, to the practice of the, of the colonial days in which everybody is a publisher. The, you know, the lonely pamphleteer that we used to talk about in colonial days has been supplanted by uh, anybody on Facebook who wants to have an opinion and register it and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and cite something as news, whether it's news or not, whether it's accurate or not. And so we are, we are back to the days of the, of, the, of the Wild West, in a way, where, where objectivity is, is not as highly prized as, uh, as, as a sharply uh, defined opinion is. And so this is where we find ourselves. And uh, in the last couple of years, with, with the advent of President Trump, we now have a very large uh, megaphone in the White House uh, uh, disparaging uh, the, the uh, the news media, which which are still trying to to, to do to, to perform objective work, uh, and and feeding these uh, these uh, I don't want to say they're all conspiracies, but the, these sentiments that uh, that that the best the, the best form of journalism now right now is is personal journalism, is whatever you want it to be, uh, as opposed to what what has traditionally been the the role of, uh, of great newspapers and television networks. Uh, so we, we find ourselves in a situation where, where trust in the press has plummeted uh, dramatically over the last 30 years. Uh, and uh, uh, this is not a good situation as far as a self-governing uh, society is concerned. If we cannot trust and, and share uh, a basic belief in facts, uh, then we are we are increasingly lost in terms of having a, a society that can govern itself, that can unify itself when, when necessary, uh, and, and that and that can function as the world's most important democracy. So uh, I conclude my little essay here with 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 an appeal uh, that uh, what we need most to do right now is, is, is uh, we, we don't blame anybody for any of this. It, it's just it's just happened. Uh, but I, I think it's I think it's important if we're going to be a a a, a self governing democracy, a, a world power, uh, the the indispensable nation, as Madeleine Albright uh, used to say, uh, we have to come to a better common understanding of, of, of the facts that we're dealing with, the decisions we have to make, uh, and, the, uh, and the civility that we need as, uh, as fellow citizens to, uh, to, to, to make this, function, this, this country function as it should. So this is not up to uh, political leaders. It's not up to media leaders, uh, in my estimation. It, it's up to us. W what are we going to expect of ourselves? What, what do we expect of our leaders, of our, of our press? And, uh, and, and it's a little, uh, I think it requires a little soul searching in the same way that uh, uh, your decision about whether to vote or not is, uh, is, is important to you. Uh, we rank uh, very far down the field in terms of voter participation and, 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 and not to vote is, is, to, is to register an opinion that you don't think this is worth your, your while, and, and that's, uh, that, that's a dangerous thing in a country like ours as well. So we feel that, uh, I mean, as I've said in, in, in this little essay here, it, it's important for us to understand that we've got a whole new environment uh, of, 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 of press freedom, of, of massive, pre massive freedom of, of thought and opinion and expression, uh, which is, is in many ways a wonderful thing, and in some <coughs> ways a dangerous thing. And uh, it's it's up to us, I think, to uh, 
to try to make sense of it all, to, 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 try, to, to try to repair to some standards of accuracy and objectivity and, and, and reliability, which is beginning to happen now, uh, so that we can, we can do our own jobs as citizens of this country. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Butler. I know here at SICE we really value placing things in historical perspective. And I remember when I was reading the first few drafts of your article, uh, what struck me was the parallels between the time of the Lonely Pamphleteer and now, and it just was something I had never thought of before. So thank, uh, thank you so much for uh, speaking to us about it today. Um, next up, we have Dr. Stephen Livingston uh, speaking to us today on the importance of strategic narratives and framing. Well, thank you very much, and I think the first thing I have to do is thank the editorial team because you probably engaged with about 27 different versions of that, <laughs> of that paper, and you did a stellar job, and you were patient with each iteration, so thank you very much. I really appreciate it. The reason for that is is that uh, this I'm going to be the most wonky, in a sense, perhaps, of the three speakers today because it's entirely conceptual. That uh, I'm, I'm talking about a way that scholars think about policy processes, think about politics, so I can't talk about, well, I will talk about specific events, but uh, what's on the table right now is the lack of utility that some people find in a principal scholarship that political scientists and sociologists uh, use in their, in their work and their research. The concept is framing. Um, we are all framers from the, from the smallest age when we told our parents that, uh, no, I wasn't responsible for it. It was my brother who did it instead of me. That's a framing contest. Uh, so uh, the problem with that concept as used by anthropologists, sociologists, political scientists, those of you who are, uh, and all, almost all of you are, international relations scholars, you may be familiar with Catherine Sakink and Margaret Keck's work on transnational advocacy networks. That's entirely a study on framing, so it's an IR concept as well. The problem that this concept has been facing in recent years uh, is, is manifold. Uh, one, it is open to a number of interpretations according to which scholar is using it. Secondly, the conditions that were most clearly identified as being necessary for doing framing analysis are no longer there. So let me explain what I mean by that. And in some ways, Dr. Uh, Afso and, and, and Mr. Butler here have sort of set up my conversation really quite nicely in the sense that the conversation about Pakistan has clear red lines as to what journalists or columnists can and cannot say. That's a kind of exercise of framing power. The officials are saying, you cannot tell that story in this way. If you do, there will be repercussions, right? So that's a framing exercise. Uh, if you think about the consequence of, of framing, if one were to describe or even have a conversation about certain kinds of laws, you would open up a, a broader conversation within society. It would be sort of a 1989 movement or moment, right? So the consequences of how we talk about something are really quite important. That's, that's important. Mr. Butler here sort of laid down the, the, the track of, well, what about in a free society? We have the First Amendment. By definition, journalists have no formal imposition of rules as to what they can and cannot say. What the scholarship has said about in political communication about what American journalists do or do not say comes to a different conclusion. It comes to the conclusion that certain power relationships define, in many instances, what journalists feel comfortable saying. Most of us, uh, most of you sitting around this table aren't old enough to remember March of 2003. Some others of us <laughs> do remember it quite clearly. Going in, I'm talking about the, the start of the, of the war in Iraq, right? The invasion of Iraq. Going into that, that war was framed clearly by both the liberal Washington Post and New York Times as well as other news organizations as being about what? About WMD, Iraqi support of terrorism, and that we were going to bring freedom, light, and democracy to Iraq. That was an outcome of a certain set of framing mechanisms that were involved between mainstream American press and the Bush administration. It had consequences, it had outcomes, and it happened in the context of a free society where the government 
offered no strict rules as what could and could not be said. It had more to do with the power relationships between news organizations, public opinion, um, think tanks, and, and all the rest that led to a set of conclusions about that particular policy that proved not to hold up uh, uh, under scrutiny and a lot of uh, death. So um, that's, that's what framing is about. It's a part of an analysis of, of um, media and power dynamics. Here's the problem, and this is what I wrote about in the, in the paper and why this, this article was such a terrific opportunity for Jack and myself. The scholarship about framing is in crisis. There is right now a prominent article that says it's time to retire the concept altogether is problematic. Why? Why is it problematic? Because all of the conditions that assume something like that 2003 policy outcome with regards to Iraq, they've disappeared. It assumes legitimate government institutions that have persuasive capabilities and a fairly coherent mainstream set of news organizations defined often by the Post, the Times, uh, the Tribune, and all of the rest. Both of those are in crisis. Government institutions, as one, somebody here said a moment ago, are in crisis. The legitimacy of government, the approval rating of Congress is, is pretty abysmal. Um, the president's approval rating is pretty abysmal with most people outside of his, his base, as it's referred to. And at the same time, again, as was referred to earlier, mainstream news organizations are suffering from a crisis of credibility and legitimacy. So there's that part of the crisis of the mechanisms that presumably support the concept of framing as an analytical device in the first place. And then you add to that the fact that, uh, um, as, as Mr. Butler said, you have uh, the concophony of alternative voices that are, are laying claim to offering the truth of the matter as they see it and as they share it with their like-minded individuals. And so you end up with this, this political, technological, and media environment that looks nothing like what existed just a handful of years ago. So therefore, the crisis becomes also, besides a political crisis, it becomes an analytical crisis. And that's what Jack and I wrote about, looking for ways to either, either jettison framing as a concept altogether, to, as, as at least as it's been used, or finding ways of building and bolstering it. Um, and, and furthermore, what the article does, I won't get into strategic frames. It's, an all, it's simply another label that gets at the same set of ideas, except for it includes the idea that rather than frames as a snapshot of a moment, there are these long-term narratives that ongoing policy fits itself into. And it's those longer term narratives that define the policy environment more than anything else. That's, that's sort of a thumbnail sketch of the point that we wish to make in, in that particular article. Uh, I, I want to leave plenty of time for, uh, for us to have a dialogue, have a conversation. Uh, but before I do, I want to add just a couple more, um, what was it, Jeff Bezos? What was that wonderful word? Complexi uh, complexifier. I want to add a couple <laughs> complexifiers. <laughs> Love that. Um, what do we mean by a journalist today? Now, Mr. Butler had a view of that, that it was anyone with a Facebook page and an opinion. Mm, let me push back against that a little bit. Um, it's a free country. It is. I can have my opinion. Let me share it. Um, uh, a, it also means that a journalist or something like a news organization, because of the technology, in other words, my point here is that it's not all doom and gloom because of technology. I really don't get into this very much, as I recall us in, in the article. But because of technology, there are serious organizations that are doing serious investigations that would have been impossible in the absence of, of a number of technologies. One, I'm going to get a little wonky. I'm, 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 I'm a technology wonk more than anything. High re commercial high resolution remote sensing satellites in panchromatic scale. Putting that into English, it means that you can put a pizza outside and a satellite can take a picture of that if it's a big pizza, if it's a large pizza, small, not, no. Uh, uh, you can take a picture of a microwave oven from 600 kilometers in space and, and identify it. You, you may say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal about that is, is Amnesty International, Organizations like Bellingcat, I wish I had PowerPoint, I'm useless without PowerPoint. Bellingcat is a London-based investigative, open source investigative unit that just got 
a whole boatload of money. Uh, uh, Bellingcat uses high-resolution remote sensing satellite imagery to identify war crimes all around the world, including in Syria, Ukraine, et cetera. So does Amnesty International. So does Situ Research in New York. So does Forensic Architecture in London. These are all examples of organizations that are not the Washington Post or the New York Times, though they work with, not the New York, the Washington Post, but they work with the New York Times on a regular basis and The Guardian and other news organizations in investigations that would be impossible in the absence of that technology. Furthermore, all of these phones that we carry with us taking pictures, I'm on the International Criminal Court's Technology Advisory Board, so I, I, I advise the ICC on how to use technology for their investigations. We, they, ICC, indicted a Libyan war cr criminal based solely on the social media posts that he and his followers put up to Facebook of every time he and his followers assassinated a group of people. They posted it on Facebook. We nabbed that video, and he's indicted, right? So uh, I guess what I'm saying is, is that the complexities of new information technology and how we understand events, how we frame events, is actually remarkable. It's fascinating, uh, and it, it, it defies being able to describe in about a 10-minute talk. So what I, if I've done anything, perhaps I've planted a few questions that we can engage with and, and have a, a conversation amongst all of us here. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Livingston. Um, yeah, I definitely didn't have the concept of framing at the forefront of my mind when I started my uh, semester uh, in the fall, but I think the concept definitely helped my grade point average uh, <laughs> as I sat down to wrote, uh, write papers on things like Chinese politics and the, the role of the media. Uh, so thank you so much, both from myself and from everybody at the editorial board uh, of the journal. So with that, uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and just open it up to you guys right away. I know I have plenty of questions for our panelists, but I, I don't want to be selfish with the remaining time. So uh, please, uh, thoughts, questions, comments for our panelists, uh, do share. Well, your, your question would break Don Graham's heart, I have to say, because his, uh, we, we, we lost a lot of money for a lot of years uh, trying to keep the price of the Washington Post as low as we could so that as many people as possible could, could read it. And, and, and the last thing we intended to do was to create some kind of gate that, uh, that, that would only uh, uh, allow well-educated people uh, Inside to our to our journalism, that was the, the the opposite of that was our was our goal. So I'm 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 sorry that your that your mother may not uh, appreciate our our, our, our journalism, uh, but I, I I do think that that that, that bears some <coughs> somewhat on 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 my friend's uh, uh, point about the uh, about the power structure. Uh, and the and, and the and the journalism uh, industry, if I can call it that, uh, being uh, maybe a little too close sometimes, as, as perhaps they were uh, at, at the outset of the of the of the Iraqi War. Uh, one of the things we did when I was in, in in the media research business with the Times Mirror Center for the People and the Press was to was to ask people. Uh, what what do you believe is, is is the biggest sin of the uh, uh, of the news media? And one of the recurring themes was that we we were too beholden to the power structure, uh, that we were that we were too much in league with the with, with, with the political leaders, that we, we were too close to them. We we were not as good as we should be at holding them accountable. This watchdog role of, of the news media is just essential as far as as far as the American people are concerned as far as our founders were concerned uh, and, and and they worry when we when we appear to get too close to the people that we cover 
uh, other things included uh, being too close to our advertisers or the people who sustain our, uh, our, 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 our revenue operations and so forth. And so th this is a constant worry, a constant concern for, uh, for, uh, for uh, among, among a, a broad swath of the American people that, that we are not as independent as we, as we need to be, as they want us to be. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the notion that, uh, that, that we are not as, that we are not as down to earth as, 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 as we should be is, is, just, is, is just an appalling notion, at least at the Washington Post. I don't know how the New York Times feels about it, but we, we try to say everything in, in plain English, and I, I'm now in public television, and, uh, and we try very hard to do, to do exactly the same thing with the P PBS NewsHour and all the other uh, programs that we have at both the national and local levels. So if your mom's not happy with the post, try the PBS News Hour. Okay. <laughs> May I address that? Uh, yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, again, I, I don't want to be the Pollyannish one up here, but I, I do want to say that the problem is is that there is a news desert in 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 large swaths of this country. Uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, some of these newspapers are actually excelling. Uh, I, Jack here is looking quickly. Maybe somebody has the figure in their head. What the New York Times digital subscription rate is just going through the roof, yes. uh, and the Post is not far behind. So, in some ways, the moms of the world are actually dialing in. They're 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 tapping in. It's the, the problem twofold in the mid mid sections of the country. Newspapers are shutting down, or newspapers are contracting to a shadow of themselves. And now I'm going to be a little partisan. And what's often filling in that space are is our Sinclair broadcasting stations, that are are actually not local. They're syndication of a national content to local products. You can find this famous YouTube video of all of the Sinclair broadcast correspondents in sync saying exactly the same thing, irrespective of where they were in the United States, because that's the ideological message that they have. So it's a mixed bag, though. And yeah. I just have a, I have a quick comment. Um, you, you know, you were, you were talking about the, the U.S., but it's really interesting to think about this in other contexts as well, where um, the media and its reach might be segmented by language. So, for instance, in Pakistan, um, there's an English language media, there's Urdu, which is the national language, and then there are sort of the, the local um, uh, languages that are sort of the regional languages. But um, the English language media tends to target, um, tends to be sort of uh, more liberal, uh, but it targets only sort of a small segment of society that is sort of educated and elite to begin with, because pa many of Pakistan's best schools and colleges are um, uh, the, the medium of instruction is English. And so they, they see there's a perpetuation of sort of the elite kind of uh, being liberal, and then the rest of the country, the vast majority of the country, tends to um, read the Urdu language newspapers and or you know watch watch TV, which is in Urdu, and there the uh, media leans to the right, and so there's a perpetuation of um, conservative views among those uh, folks, and that's why the English language media is faces sort of less censorship as well uh, relative to the Urdu language me media because you know those who might censor know that it's not reaching everyone <laughs> so so you know there you can actually get by by saying more so it's a it's really sort of important to think about this in other contexts as well um, and how segmentation might shape views of, of people all right uh, Maureen Which is your business?
May I yeah, respond? Mm. So if I might, first of all, thank you very much for your observation. You're absolutely right, and, and that's why talking about technology needs to be put into the language that we drew on in writing the article about framing contests. Um, uh, so you're right, you're, you're absolutely right, and it goes beyond what you said. I mean, Shoshana uh, Zuboff uh, has a new book out called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, uh, about 600-page tome, beautifully written, though, that gets at exactly your point. Uh, Yevgeny Morozov uh, wrote a book several years ago called The Net Delusion. So this is a recognized phenomenon. It isn't, you know, that, that for every good you can find an application where it, it's being used for, for nefarious purposes. So you're right. Um, I'll open the floor up to anyone else who wants to. Well, I, let me just say that um, we had uh, Marty Barron, the executive editor of the Washington Post, at our public media summit uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, his, his, uh, his message to us, and, and I think our, our common message uh, to everybody, is that our, our job in these very unusual times is just to do our job uh, and, and, and to play things as straight as we can uh, and, and, and not worry over much about whether everybody's going to believe everything that we that we say. The second thing I would say, and, and, and ultimately I think the truth will will out, and, uh, and, and I, I, I have that faith and I, I, I certainly hope that, that, that that's going to be the case. The, the second thing to say, and I refer to this a little bit in, in my article, is that we, we can be, we, 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 can, we can put too much uh, emphasis on the uh, uh, on, on, on the notion that, 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 that truth is relative, the more, uh, frankly, cable news that we watch. And uh, there, there, there are these three cable news networks now that are on 24-7. They, 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 they tend to take a, a, a fact reported by the Washington Post or the New York Times uh, and, and, and talk about it for 24 hours. Uh, and and that, that's a good business model. I mean, I, I don't want to disparage these folks. I mean, the NBC News and, and others re, uh, do some good reporting also. But if, if you watch it, uh, you, you'll see that they are typically taking a, a few facts that, 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 that a few uh, really highly reputable uh, news organizations will report and just analyze them to death. Uh, but, but the bigger point is that this is a small universe of people that is, that is following these things as closely as, as people in this room do. Uh, the, the, the combined audience on a good day of cable news is 10 million people out of a country of 330 million people. Most people are doing something very different than worrying about what the size of President Trump's uh, inaugural crowd was and, and that sort of thing. There, there, there is a pe Chris group Hans. of people who live inside this bubble, who care about these things, and the great mass of the American people, this young lady's mother, couldn't care less. And, and I, think, I think that is ultimately the great strength of our country here, that people are, are practical, they have their own lives to live, they, uh, they, they will make big decisions when they, when they need to make them, and, uh, and, and they tend not to, not to be bothered by the, by the chatter that, that, that tends to uh, entrance us around here. So I, I don't think the problem is as big or, or as, uh, as bad as, as, as some people in, in, in my business th think it is, uh, uh, but uh, I'm happy to be correct. <laughs> no, actually, I was going to say he's right. And as a matter of fact, Yokai Benkler at Harvard uh, has a, a book out called Network Propaganda, uh, along with uh, Ferris and Roberts, uh, that says exactly this, but it, it, they say it through exhaustive empirical research, that the universe of people that you're worried about is off to itself, and it's a feedback loop between Fox News uh, and a handful of websites that used to be Infowars, this was, it was prominently in that. And, and the mainstream of the conversation is going on amongst news organizations that still hold truth-telling as their ultimate goal, whether they are conventional conservatives or, or liberals. So the, the, the problem has to do with a, a much smaller universe of people who watch things like Fox News on a regular basis. Jane Mayer's current article in The New Yorker on Fox News is, is, is recommended, too. It's brilliant. It's really good. 
I, I'll just comment briefly, just a couple of observations uh, based on your initial comment on sort of Facebook and, and thinking about sort of the bad side of the story. So interestingly, again, you know, I'll talk from my experience in the Pakistani context and the field work I was doing for my book. Um, as I noted in my paper, um, a lot of so social media is essentially free in, in Pakistan. You know, people have access to it. And one thinks of that as a good thing. However, many conspiracy theories abound on, on social media, so about terrorist groups um, and such. You know, I, I remember actually sitting, interviewing students, and them telling me, look, we saw um, a video uh, that, said, that, that shows us that um, terrorists are being trained in America. So America is actually uh, training terrorists, right? So fake news, uh, a fake sort of video or, uh, you know, what, however it was constructed, and actually sort of brainwashing the minds of uh, young, impressionable um, students. And so, you know, one thinks about how one can sort of regulate that kind of media environment. Um, that's important. But I think what's also really um, important to think about, and this is not just in the Pakistani context, we know people consume fake news, like not, not fake news, um, such as what's, you know, the, the New York Times has been labeled fake news, not that kind of fake news, but actual fake news here. Um, and so uh, one needs to think about things like media literacy and critical thinking and how, um, uh, how this can be taught in classrooms so that students can figure out when they go into the real world Look, you know, this may look like a real newspaper, this may look like a real video, but it's not. It's actually fake. Um, and so those are interesting things to think about across context. I know there, there has been some effort to incorporate that in curricula here, but Italy is actually, they're incorporating it into their public school curriculum, um, how to sort of consume um, news. Yeah. Okay, right here. <laughs> That's their purpose. <laughs> um, any further questions? Uh, if not, uh, I have one uh, very quickly for. Uh... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, if, if I'm also, sorry, go ahead. Also, uh, the numbers. Right. Yep. Ben Clear, that book I referred to earlier, puts Rush Limbaugh actually, along with Sean Hannity's radio program, along with um, Matt Drudge's website as the the sort of the hub of, of the entire ecosystem. Well, I was just going to say that, that the public television stations are literally everywhere. We have 350 of them around the country, and they are doing more and more work, particularly as newspapers have more and more challenges, uh, to cover the state legislatures and the, and the city halls and so forth with, uh, with what, we, what we try very hard to make uh, objective reporting. And uh, as, as I mentioned in, 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 the, in the piece here, uh, we are rewarded for that with, with, with very high levels of trust across the, uh, the political spectrum. So it, it's, not, it's not automatic that people are just not going to trust the same set of facts. They, they, they typically do uh, at, at, at the level where they, can, where they can have some verification on their own, the closer to where they live. 
uh, and, and they know that we're playing it straight. And so we get, we get very good marks across the political spectrum for the kind of, uh, of reporting that we do in, in the state legislatures and city halls of the country. Yeah, uh, so I actually had a question for you about the role of local public television stations. Um, you, as you mentioned, uh, the fact that people can sort of verify what they're saying on at least some level lends them a lot of credibility. Is there any way to reliably scale that up? Or is there some, or is it, or are the qualities that make uh, local television stations so trustworthy just eventually lost as they go, you know, nationwide? Or well, uh, we, we, we are scaled up at, at the local level. As I say, we are, we are, we are in 350 uh, markets around the country, or 350 stations serving more than 200 uh, official television markets. And, uh, and, and, and not, not everybody does as, as an exhaustive a job and as comprehensive a job as, as everybody else. And so it's, uh, it's a bit of a patchwork right now, but that's one of my jobs is to get everybody uh, mm -hmm. up, to, uh, up, to a, up to a good standard. Uh, at, but, but at the national level, we, we do have the PBS News Hour, we have Washington Week, we have Frontline, we have lots of programs on, on public television that, that again, uh, uh, command a, a, a great deal of trust uh, and value across the political spectrum. Uh, it, I think it's, I think it's going to be very difficult, uh, and, and we don't pretend to do this to, to replace the the decaying uh, newspaper industry around the country. Uh, it, it, it's uh, we, we're not, we don't have the resources for this, uh, and I don't know of, of anybody who who has a a compelling enough business model to just replicate what newspapers did so well for so long. Uh, that that's a big problem. We're we're, we're trying to do our part, uh, and uh, I, I will say that the commercial uh, broadcast stations do. They, they devote a lot of time every day to uh, to local news. I mean, hours and hours of it. You can just watch your own local news here in Washington. Uh, it, it does tend to focus on on traffic and weather and crime and sports and so forth, and and not as much in depth uh, coverage as as we would tend to do. But uh, but again, in, in the cacophony of, uh, of, 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 of voices, uh, I think people have a uh, have a, uh, a fair chance of knowing what's going on in their community. Okay, so um, we were very lucky. We we're very lucky to have uh, a, a great newspaper like the Washington Post here, the New York Times, and and, and there are other ones. I, I don't want to say that we're the last two left. There are there are some really good newspapers around the country, uh, and we have to try to fortify them as much as we can. So for those of you who have class at two, feel free to go on uh, ahead, but um, we'll keep taking questions as long as people have them. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Corey. Um, I had a question directly about questions about what is the role that Yeah, no, so that's a great that's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up because I I wanted to to sort of highlight an interesting paradox. Um, so for instance, the the New York Times, um, it used to be the International Herald Tribune published in Pakistan, now it's the International New York Times. Um, so when you subscribe to the Express Tribune, you get the International New York Times and it's like <coughs> a selected set of articles that are published in Pakistan. But fascinatingly, if there's an article, let's say, critical of the Pakistani military, or that covers, um, you know, one of the red lines that I've spoken about in the or written about in the paper, that the the Pakistani state will have that blanked out in the in the International New York Times version, and so you can actually see a comparison of something that is published in a in another country and the International New York Times, and it's it's literally. The, the place of the column is there, but it's, it's just blank. And interestingly, it's most often um, a columnist who is Pakistani, who has written, he's a, it's Mohammed Hanif, for instance, his columns might be blanked out, and he, and he, and he writes it, uh, yeah, it's not mine. <laughs> uh, but he, uh, uh, he, he writes a column that's critical, and that's just, um, in his own country blanked out. But 
what that fails to take account of is the fact that people can access it online. And it's being shared widely on social media, and people are able to access it. Uh, and it's up on the website. And so it assumes that people don't have internet access. But anyone who's actually subscribing to this English language newspaper has the uh, International New York Times coming to their home has uh, has um, has internet access. And so, um, so that, that's one part of the story. The other part of the story is, yes, so there are all these international organizations reporting in the country. Uh, you know, the BBC, the New York Times, uh, um, the Washington Post has a person out in Islamabad, and, and um, the Guardian, and so on. Um, and there are articles that are, again, accessible, accessible online. Um, they do get some criticism for presenting a biased view uh, that is critical of the country uh, from, from locals. Um, but again, they can access it. Mm -hmm. Yep, go ahead. So far, we've been discussing mostly the Jewish people. Mostly what? The Jewish people. are looking for reinforcement. Yeah. You're mentioning, like, going to get the media off because they've got their dedicated audiences. I think that's part of the problem. If people don't want to be challenged, they are looking for new sources that can reinforce their pre-existing points of view by the full. Maybe get a, a little bit deeper. One of the reasons I think one of the clips don't want to see Facebook is now all these friends who post on Facebook. I've never seen anybody's mind <laughs> any evidence <laughs> that anybody possesses. Well, I, I don't know if that's if that's changed. I mean, I, I think that's the way things have always been. Don't don't you? No. Yeah, that's you, not you don't think I so? I don't think so because at, at one point when you and I were growing up, your choices were limited both technologically. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And now you can choose. One. And as a matter of fact, this goes back as another element of the criticisms that could one could raise against you know technology. Not only what you in in political science, what you're describing is called selective exposure and motivated reasoning. It's a whole field, there are whole fields of study and you can find thousands of PhD dissertations about it. <laughs> um, and and it's a real problem. You, it, you, and, and it goes all the way back to a guy named uh, Festinger who said that there's this idea called cognitive dissonance. We don't like being confronted with things that we, that, that upset us, upset our worldview. But now here's the technology part. What has happened with social media is algorithms are being trained by what you look at, what you click on, and so the YouTube recommendations, the things that are shared on your, on your news feeds and social media are being tailored according to what the algorithm thinks that you want. Furthermore, with especially with YouTube, there is a profit motive in, in that, in that they think that to hold your attention to the next video, they have to be ever more extreme. So they dig deeper into the extreme nature of whatever the content is with each recommendation, which has, a, in some people's view, a radicalizing effect. If you are being fed ever more radical content, it's going to reinforce your pre-existing uh, beliefs, but also make them more extreme at the same time. So, so you're right, uh, and, and it is made worse by a technological environment where we can find a flavor of our choice all the time. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I, I, I thought what one, one of the things that you were saying was that people, I mean, co consumers will, will consume or they won't, and, and there's there's a, a certain number of people who just tune all of this out, and, and I think that's always been the case and always will be the case, uh, but to the extent that there are people who, uh, and, and technologies that are able now to uh, reinforce your own opinion and, 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 and shield you from any other opinion, 
you know, that, that is unprecedented, and uh, it's something we need to be, uh, I think, a little wary of. I think the, the one thing I would add is that um, the danger is, uh, obviously the danger is there on social media because of the algorithms um, and because people tend to share, you know, their networks are the same, they tend to share things that kind of perpetuate the, the thought in their network or, or the opinions in their network. However, um, if one thinks of um, the New York Times or the Washington Post um, and their op-ed you know, while they may, both newspapers may lean liberal, their op-ed columnists are from both sides of the political spectrum, and to the extent that these large news organizations um, still commit to doing that, and they, they receive criticism for it, and, you know, the New York Times certainly receives criticism for uh, some of its choice of op-ed columnists, but, or opinion columnists, but you can actually, um, if you subscribe to that, you know, like it or not, you're going to open up the editorial page and you can actually get both sides of the political spectrum. And I think that kind of journalism is really, ne or that kind of uh, uh, news source um, and writing is really necessary, that exposure. <coughs> Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. That's it's right. A, it's a plea for hope I hear. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I will say first of all that, that there is some recent uh, public opinion research that that, that 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 does suggest that people are beginning to come back to traditional news sources, uh, uh, in the belief that that at least the, their their facts are, are vetted and verified, uh, and that and that there is. Uh, there is somebody out in the world who's actually trying to, to, to create a, or to, to reveal some objective truth, uh, which I think people, notwithstanding the fact that, that some may want to just have their opinions reinforced, that some people uh, really want to uh, want to know. And uh, so that, that gives me a little faith to begin with. And, and secondly, I, I do think it's uh, you know, the, the evolution that we have seen uh, in, in, in the news media, and, and it's, it's you know, as, as, uh, I guess it was Mark Twain who said, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Uh, the, uh, the, the fact that we, that we had this, this highly contentious and partisan uh, 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 press in, in, in the earliest days, which was supplanted uh, by, the, uh, by, by, by the commitment to objectivity that I, I've described, uh, I, I think we're, we're likely to see that again because I, I just don't think this is sustainable. And I, I think people are beginning to understand uh, that, uh, the, that the technology is not benign, that, that it's not neutral, uh, that it is le leading us in, in, in some direction we don't want to be led in. Uh, and uh, th this may take some time and, uh, you know, the the, uh, the 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 cycle may may be may may speed up a little bit as as, as everything else has in, in the modern age, but uh, I, I do have faith that that we we have to have we have to have and and, and we want to have uh, a common set of, uh, of facts and, uh, and, 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 and 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 some agreed upon truths that uh, that we can make uh, major decisions on. Uh, and again, this this is this is not. This is not the, the, the cable news universe that I'm talking about here. I mean, these are people who are at Swords Point all the time and just enjoy it. But, 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 the, but the great mass of the American people uh, are, are thinking about lots of other things and, and, they, and they want to know what they need to know in order to make decisions on it. And, and I think that's, uh, that's going to be our saving grace. It, you, know, you, you could call it apathy. Uh, I just don't care about what you're saying. Uh, but when they need to know uh, and, and when they want to know, there, there, are, there are opportunities for them to know, and, and they are increasingly repairing uh, to the people who, 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 who they feel they can trust. And, 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 and all of these technological uh, uh, 
innovations, uh, if I can put a positive term on it, uh, are, are going to be held in an increasing suspicion, I think, with uh, by, by people who understand that they can be manipulated as they didn't understand before. Perfect. I would only add that the New York Times subscriptions have gone north, total revenue north of a billion dollars because of those same digital networks that allow people in Iowa to get the New York Times, you know, uh, in real time rather than three days later. So, um, you know, it, 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 as was said, technology doesn't have a single path. It has multiple manifestations. We actually call that an affordance, but we won't go into the language. Um, it depends on the intention of the people using the technology, not the technology itself. That's what it means. All right. Yeah. All right. Last question, and then I think yeah, we have to wrap up. To go. I just yeah. like to start with the question of what. I just like to explore that a little. What I do is definitely a distinction. The kind of politics that turns out to every Thursday, uh, every uh, Thanksgiving, a lot of advocacy. All the news about the health. All sorts of things like that. We heard it from all sorts of channels. But we never considered that journalism. Uh, journalism today seems to be papers are stimuli. You have the discretion not to report them. Full discretion, just by virtue of being the owner of the outlet. audience is going to learn about things that are in other sources. Well, I, I will just say, in, in the context of the federal shield law that I'm sure this young lady and, and Glenn and others have, uh, have been uh, working on for, for quite some time, uh, the definition of a journalist uh, who would qualify for the protections of the federal shield law, which, is, which means uh, the ability to, to, to keep one's sources confidential, uh, has been, has been as, as vexing an issue as, as one can possibly imagine. Uh, and, and for many of the reasons that you're talking about, and, and, and the reasons are proliferating with, 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 with social media. You know, who's to say that, that, that you know, I'm a journalist because I get paid for it, and you're not because you're performing the same uh, function uh, as, as, a, as a free citizen? Uh, well, some, somebody's going to make that decision about whether, whether you get to... Uh, whether you get the protection, whether whether you're whether you're going to get hauled off to jail or not because you've revealed a a, uh, a source, or or whether you have revealed uh, confidential information that uh, that isn't in the public domain on purpose, uh, the, these are these are big questions, and uh, uh, I don't think we've gotten to a final resolution of them. When I was at the Washington Post Company, one of my jobs was to try to get this federal shield law passed, and I got. Mike Pence, Congressman Mike Pence, and Congressman John Conyers uh, to co-sponsor the same piece of legislation uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to protect the confidentiality of journalist sources. When it got to the Senate, this, this exact issue of who is a journalist 
uh, reared its head, and uh, even though we got the thing passed out of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee on a vote of 15 to 4, we couldn't ever get it on the, on the Senate floor to get it passed in the Senate because this exact question was something that, that just confounded the people who were going to make this decision. And we were doing this largely uh, in, in the time of, of, the, of the Iraqi war. Uh, and, and a lot of these folks say, why in the world, why in the world would we, would we run the risk of, of, of revealing information that might help our, our enemy across the world? So you put your finger on the question, and the, the answer is incomplete. Two quick responses. Number one, his status as a New York Times reporter of great renown and great reputation, Jim Risen, was harassed for a good part of a decade uh, because of the absence yep. of a federal shield law. And he was harassed by the Obama administration, um, by that Justice Department. If you're referring back to my question of what is a journalist, by that what I mean is, is that if you were to look at the reporting of the New York Times Video Investigations Unit that was, that's headed up by um, Maliki Brown, a brilliant journalist, an electrical engineer who became a journalist, all of their journalism is actually done, I mean, it comes out under the New York Times with a New York Times reporter, Maliki Brown, with his name on it, but behind that are satellite technicians, you know, all kinds of very technical fields that have gone into the analysis of the data that is the stuff of what he does. Now, Maliki is, the report, is a reporter, he's a journalist, but what about the, the, the architects at Forensic Architecture City in London who are using 3D modeling to reconstruct a, 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 a crime scene, essentially? Uh, are they journalists? They don't call themselves journalists, but they are integral to the nature of that kind of reporting. So my point is, is that that today the 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 the, the reporter who intrepidly goes out on him uh, on their own his or herself to report a story all by themselves doesn't exist so much anymore. There's a lot of data analysis that sort of thing that's behind it, and where you where you cut off what is a journalist and what is not isn't clear. All right. Well, thank you to those of you who stuck with us. Uh, apologies for going a bit over time. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.